Welcome everyone to the SPIN presentation um, for Here to Help, uh, supporting student well-being and mental health um, by the Office of Student Support Services and Hawaii Families as Allies. And uh, we're here to present, whoop, excuse me. We're here to present on trauma-informed care practices. We're running this marathon and it's being in our shoes. I'd like to present myself. I'm CJ Chapel, and you, a lot of you might know me as Rice. I switched back to my maiden name and I'm with the Office of Student Support Services. And here are my other colleagues, Molly. Aloha everyone, I'm Molly Takagi and I am also with the Office of Student Support Services. And we also have Chanel. Hi everyone, my name is Chanel Lum with Hawaii Families as Allies. And we're here to present on trauma-informed care practices. Um, today, looking at that, often we don't understand what is the meaning of trauma or trauma-informed care. Also looking at what are those warning signs, not only for our keiki, but also for ourselves. Uh, learning also how students who have experienced trauma um, how they're identified for supports within the school system and where services are provided. And also looking, what are, what are those evidence-based practices that we can use both at home and at school to help support them? And we'll look at all of the resources that are online and in our community uh, as we support our keiki. Let's start with the first um, trauma-informed practice, and that is doing a self-check. So how are you feeling today? Uh, let's look at those cats and uh, just think, what number are you at? I must admit, this morning when I woke up, I was definitely a six. <laughs> and then when I walked into work, I was a four, a little frazzled. And now I'm um, working with all of you and seeing all of you. I'm a one, feeling really good. We want to always self-regulate and do a check-in because if we aren't feeling well or at our best, sometimes that's not maybe the best time to um, speak to others or lead a meeting. So we always want to take time again to regroup, which is another good um, strategy for um, trauma-informed practices to take that mindful minute just to give yourself time to breathe. They say stress is excitement without the breath. So let's just take a minute to breathe and regroup. Here we go. That was one minute. For some of us, it was like, oh, I wish I had more time. That was so relaxing. And others might have felt like, oh, that took forever. Um, but having that mindful minute in schools and at home changed the, changes the whole atmosphere and climate. So just give yourself a mindful minute when you get a chance. It's another great strategy. Oops. All right, let's look at, um, first, let's look at the foundation before we do a deeper dive into trauma-informed practices and look at what we provide for all students 
and thinking of all our children um, who we're working with. So trauma-informed practices are embedded within our comprehensive approach to fostering student mental health and well-being. The Hawaii Department of Education Here to Help is a movement to build student and family awareness of current school-based practices, programs, and services, and ensure that students feel cared for by promoting safe and supportive environments fostered by positive relationships. So this campaign is happening for all faculty and staff and students to be ready to support um, students and each other. So when we look at the foundation of um, education in Hawaii, we always ask the question, how does a school meet the needs of all its students? And when we look at that, we found there were several things that were important. And that was to establish what a school believes. It's important for us to make sound choices based on the right information. It's important to know our students, really know our students and coordinate their resources to meet the needs um, for all of them. So we took those four basic questions, foundational questions, and we came up with the Hawaii multi-tiered system of support. Now, multi-tiered systems of supports are throughout education throughout the nation, but Hawaii, we specifically looked at these four core components. So we look at what are the foundational beliefs. We want to make sure we use data-driven team-based decision-making. It's important that we have universal screening and progress monitoring is vital to make sure that we provide supports needed for our students and that we come from a multi-tiered system of evidence-based practices to provide that coordinated support. Uh, you might have seen this um, before if you've gone to a DOE presentation, but when we look at it, we have this pyramid or triangle that explains that we wanna make sure that all students are supported um, as needed. So that green tier one at the bottom of the pyramid is what do we do to provide uh, supports for all students. And then we know some students need additional support, not in place of, but in addition to, and that would be those tier two supports. And then they might be fine in certain areas with tier one or tier two, but sometimes also our students need that individualized support, and that would be a tier three support. So we throughout the day and throughout the programs provide, again, those multi-tiered system of supports um, for our students. Also, I wanted to show you on the bottom, there are four key domains. So we look at the whole child, not just academics. We look at academics, behavioral, social, emotional, and we're the only state, I believe, in the nation that also looks at those physical uh, the physical domain. So we really look at the whole child and meeting the needs of the whole child. Um, when we look at meeting those needs, we want to prioritize that well-being and those mental health priorities to make sure, again, we're providing that support. So when we look at the different um, elements of that, first of all, we have safe and supportive learning environments. So looking at making sure we have a safe and supportive school that students are engaged and, and are attending. We also want to look at social emotional learning for students and adults. We look at all faculty and all staff and students and also looking at our communities and parents and families that we're all supported. Um, we found that this year coming back to in person, um, that sense of belonging was low. And a lot of the schools looked at that priority of now that all our students and faculty and staff are back in school, how to provide that sense of belonging and that engagement for school. Another component is to increase mental health literacy and connections that support student well being. And that's where Here to Help comes in. HELP stands for Honor Connectedness, Engage in Open Conversations, Learn Needs and Identify Strengths, and Provide Resources. So having that help and training all our faculty and staff in those supports um, really helps our students. Another component is 
component is ongoing screening and progress monitoring. It's really that progress monitoring and supporting our students that really helps that improvement. Uh, when we look at this, um, we have this year, you might not have known, we have the student success dashboard that looks at, it's provided for all schools can use to look, that looks at what is, how are we doing social emotionally? How are we doing academically? How's our attendance? How's our behavior? And providing that, those supports. So that way we have early identification. You don't want to wait till someone falls through the cracks. You want to what? Have that early identification and put those supports in place right away. Um, the other thing is we have those continuum, continuum of support. So that equitable access for mental health services. So as you look, we have school-wide promotion for our staff, teachers, and counselors providing that support for our students. We have those targeted or prevention interventions, and then we have those intensive supports like our school-based behavioral health and other supports. Just to let you know, um, we have uh, to make sure all families and all students and all parents have access to those mental health support services. We have Hazel Health. So any family, um, any parent can ask for those additional supports. Uh, just check with the school counselor or school-based be behavioral health. And you can, they provide Hazel Health Services, also Hawaii Keiki, also the University of Hawaii, um, and many of our community-based services. So it's really providing that continuum of care for all at all times, not just in school, but also um, in the community. So we have that continuum of care. So we look at what are the tier one um, things in support and in effect for all of our students. Also, what are tier two available for our students and those tier three interventions. Another petal of that um, kind of flower of mental health priorities and supports is professional development for adults. So it's important that through Here to Help, we train all our faculty and staff support to support students. Also, um, Act 270, we provide um, suicide prevention, awareness, and protocol training for all staff. And uh, Molly's going to talk a little bit more about we have practice wise and trauma informed care now available to all staff. Uh, another area is also in crisis. So we want to make sure that um, if we're dealing with crisis, that there is well trained um, response for suicide prevention, crisis and trauma response. What are protective factors as well? Because we look at that HMTSS framework and how we uh, provide those supports for all students. We look at those um, mental health and well being priorities. And so, if you think as a parent, we think of a family as a family member or a staff member, how can we provide those protective factors for our children, for our keiki? And one is the HA. Our schools and our, our the schools provide that that foundation and really creating that sense of well-being and belonging, responsibility, sense of excellence, aloha, total well-being, and sense of place, sense of aina, uh, Hawaii. Um, we look at those are protective factors when we provide those supports um, for students. The other thing is a good example, like the Kauai Longitudinal Study on Resiliency. It's a top resiliency study in the world came from Hawaii. And they did a study and saying back, it was way back in the 60s, 50s and 60s, they decided, okay, if a child is born and might be in an at-risk environment for, versus a supportive environment, what are the factors that come into play? And they they realize that there are certain factors, even though they might have been brought up in a more at-risk environment, certain factors that made the difference for their success. And two of the ones we focus on um, are, and we nickname it, who is your mama, right? A meaningful adult and a meaningful activity. 
those are huge protective factors for our students. So ask, ask your child, who is a meaningful adult on that campus at school? And what is a meaningful activity that you have on your school campus? Because that's what provides resiliency, that, that's what provides um, the support. And you can ask that in your family and in the community. What's a, who's a meaningful adult in your child's community activities? And um, what's a meaningful activity in there? Do they like drama? Do they like um, art or painting? Do they like athletics? Do they like canoe paddling? Do they like the ocean? Um, what do they enjoy participating in? So those are huge protective factors. Oops. Wow. And um, I think I'm right on time. Boy, that's really surprising for me. Um, but we wanted to lay that foundation before we did a deeper dive into trauma-informed practices. So realize that's a foundation for all students. And when we look at our children, um, what we want in place. But before I bring Molly up, let's take a one-minute stretch break, which is another trauma-informed practice to always, again, have that physical activity to re-engage our brain and work on both sides of our frontal lobe so we're ready to learn. So let's follow along and do it there um, at your home or wherever you're watching this video. Here we go. One-minute stretch break. Just follow along. Wow, you guys did really good. Yeah, getting that physical activity, even doing things like chair yoga and things like that really help re-engage the mind for learning, not only for our students, but for us as adults. So with that stretch break, I'm going to turn it over to Molly and uh, to go do a deeper dive into trauma-informed care. Thank you, CJ. That was great. I needed that stretch break. So we're going to start with the definition or a definition of trauma. The Substance Abuse and Mental Health Services Administration, or SAMHSA, defines individual trauma as using these three E's. It results from an event, a series of events, or a set of circumstances that's experienced by an individual as physically or emotionally harmful or life-threatening. So it's important to note that not all individuals will experience trauma from the same event. It really has to do with how an individual reacts. Um, and the last E of the three E's definition is that the the trauma experienced from the event has lasting adverse effects on that individual. It affects their ability to function, their mental, physical, social, emotional, or spiritual well-being in some way. So traumatic events can come in many forms. They range from one-time events or experiences that are chronic or even generational. We're learning a lot about historical and generational trauma as well. So whether an event is traumatic for a child, it really depends on their experience um, 
and potentially the protective factors in place that CJ was describing. Um, but it's really important that educators, families, um, all adults who care for children become trauma informed in order to understand the potentially uh, short or long term harmful effects that it can have. So if you can go to the next slide, CJ. Unfortunately, Trauma in childhood is very prevalent. There's a high uh, incidence of childhood trauma. In fact, studies indicate that almost up to two thirds of children will experience an event that creates trauma for them by the age of 16. And 46% of children in Hawaii will experience what's called an adverse childhood experience um, or ACEs. Um, to learn more about ACEs, we've included a link to a video here with Nadine Burke Harris. Dr. Harris is the um, Surgeon General for California, and she really helped to popularize and um, spread the understanding of the ACEs study um, because Research is really indicating that the more we know about trauma, the more we learn about ACEs, uh, the more we can proactively put those preventative and, and protective uh, factors in place for children. Um, another disturbing um, statistic is that Native Hawaiian and Pacific Islander children do experience ACEs at a higher rate as well. This visual um, illustrates some of the different factors uh, across gender, across age groups of the types of uh, experiences that can cause trauma for children. And you'll see that the adverse experiences listed in the lower right hand corner shows the diversity of experiences that can cause trauma. It's not just a life threatening event necessarily, but it could be something like physical or emotional or sexual abuse as well as emotional or physical neglect, household substance abuse. So if there's a family member or someone that a child lives with who's abusing substances that can create trauma, household mental illness, a mother treated with violence, parent separation or divorce, or having a family member incarcerated. So I point those out to, to just really drive home that point of, um, it depends on how the child experiences that um, the ACE and um, it can range. Um, so um, adults report that adverse childhood ex experiences are common. And research suggests that as rates of adverse childhood experiences rise, so does the risk for challenges in adulthood, such as high-risk behaviors, illness, and early death. So you'll see on the next slide some of the effects. And obviously, we want to prevent trauma for all children um, because we see these really terrible effects um, between childhood trauma, um, the onset of chronic disease and mental, mental illness in childhood or later, later on in adulthood. And when we're thinking about the school experience, trauma can really interfere with a lot of skills that are necessary for our children to succeed in school. So trauma can affect their language and communication skills, healthy relationship development, their ability to be attentive in class, general executive functions that are necessary for learning um, and remembering. Uh, it can affect motivation and it can affect behavior in class. So some of the um, trainings that we'll talk about in a minute uh, that CJ actually already mentioned um, are about helping adults, teachers, caregivers to recognize some of the effects of trauma so that we can inter intervene when we do see some of these effects before it becomes problematic. So on the next slide, we'll see warning signs of trauma by age. And it's important to note that these are just examples. Um, the effects of trauma can vary uh, widely um, but we've outlined some of the key warning signs of trauma by age. For elementary age students, it can present as um, sudden fear, anxiety, or worry. Sometimes um, young children will express this as a stomach ache or a headache, mm -hmm. and they may not be able to express that emotion of, I'm actually feeling worried, but they might say, oh, I have a stomach ache, I don't want to go to school. And the activity that we started with today doing the emotion check-in is a really powerful one to do with children at home or at school to help them start to recognize um, the connection between those physiological responses and their emotions, help them begin to label and recognize how they're feeling. Um, so it could also present as difficulty with authority, difficulty taking criticism. 
Um, some elementary age students um, may show a, a unwillingness to work independently, or they may have show struggles bouncing back from disappointing events. When we get into middle and high school age students, um, adolescents, a lot of the warning signs may look similar, um, but they, you might notice that a child is having difficulty forming friendships or having other positive relationships. They may express repetitive thoughts that are concerning. They may show clinginess. Trauma can also present as just a decline in school performance, um, uh, in, a increased sleepiness or increased um, unwillingness to go to school. And there can also be a connection to an increase in risk-taking behaviors such as drug and alcohol abuse. Um, you'll notice that in the third column, we have um, uh, warning signs for staff and other adults because it's important for us to recognize that um, trauma can affect anyone of any age and care, uh, school staff are at risk of experiencing not only firsthand trauma, but also secondary trauma as well. So the trainings that we're providing um, help adults begin to recognize if they may have experienced trauma that may be affecting their ability to be their best self as well. So increased anxiety, reduced energy and focus, trouble regulating, difficulty managing responses. Um, adults may find that they're more reactive, controlling, or, or punitive in their relationship with students. Um, and this really can lead to lots of negative impacts on school safety and culture, their relationships with students. So helping staff begin to recognize their own experiences of trauma is an important piece of the work that we're doing um, in our office as well. So I'll go into a little bit more detail about these professional development opportunities. The first is a capacity building professional development opportunity that we are providing to all of our um, school-based behavior health. That's our counselors and then the school-based behavior health staff members in schools. This is provided through a, a platform called PracticeWise. And it began this year for our school staff. We've had 60 staff members um, participating and they're on track to earn their managing and adapting practice direct service credential this school year. So this allows our direct providers within schools to know what to do when they recognize the signs of trauma, how to best treat and support students who are showing those signs of trauma, as well as some feedback on is what they're doing to provide care, is it effective, is it helping their students to, um, to grow as students and to um, deal with some of the effects of trauma that they may be presenting. So that's a great opportunity. We are also providing a system-wide training opportunity. So this is, um, unlike the practice-wise opportunity, which is targeted for those mental health practitioners, the Trauma-Informed Online Academy is being offered to every single staff member in the Hawaii Department of Education. So it's an amazing opportunity for us to become a trauma-informed organization where all adults um, know some of the material that we're covering today, the basics of trauma, the basics of trauma-informed classroom practices, um, resources for administrators so that they can potentially shift some of their um, um, instructional practices or um, you know, behavior correction practices. I'm having a blank on the word discipline. There we go. Discipline practices um, in order to be better trauma-informed. Um, and as I mentioned, this is for all staff. So even non-instructional staff have the opportunity to participate in this asynchronous online training. We also have a parent track. I'll just mention that briefly. And I think there's another slide. Um, if parents are interested in taking a deeper dive on trauma and learning how to become more trauma-informed in their parenting, that is something that we are able to offer to anyone in the state who's interested in learning more. Okay, so on this slide, I'll talk a little bit more about the connections to SEL. CJ's done a fantastic job of illustrating and guiding us through um, some of these social emotional learning practices that are trauma informed. So any classroom or um, learning environment, working environment where we're working with others, um, we have the opportunity to be trauma informed, to be mindful of emotions, to be mindful of our humanity in these spaces. So 
the connections that we're making within our office between trauma-informed care and social emotional learning are really important. So we're encouraging teachers and school staff to create inclusive, supportive classroom environments where all students know that they're welcome, that they're valued, um, no matter what their background may be or no matter what sorts of traumas they may have experienced. Um, teachers are also being encouraged and, and coached in how to provide direct instruction in social emotional learning skill development. So the types of practices like breathing exercises, emotions check-ins, um, incorporating movement. Those are all examples of ways that we can teach children how to regulate their own emotions and build stronger relationships um, and all of those great SEL skills that they need to be successful. We also um, are offering the Panorama Survey, which is an opportunity for students to self-assess their own um, social emotional competencies and take a look at their mindsets their resilience, um, the, the ways that they are connecting with their classmates and teachers. And it provides the schools, the teachers and school administrators with great information about students' SEL skills as well. So we're providing training, professional development in all of these areas um, in alignment with um, the Trauma-Informed Online Academy. Okay, we have some links here um, for any families, caregivers who may be interested in learning more about what we are providing from the Office of Student Support Services, um, as well as the broader DOE. So we have SEL resources for parents, families, and educators, um, as well as panorama resources, here to help resources. And, and you'll see in the lower left-hand corner that parent track that's referring to the Trauma-Informed Online Academy. So please feel free to reach out to our office if you are interested in getting a login um, to participate in that um, asynchronous online academy just to learn more. Um, it can be great for us as adults to learn more about trauma for ourselves and our own relationships as well as parenting or caregiving. Um, so it's, I highly recommend it if anyone is interested in taking an even deeper dive. And with that, I'm going to hand it off to our partner, Chanel. Hi, thank you. Thank you, Molly. Great information. Um, so for my section, I really wanted to start off kind of building upon the resources that were shared. And uh, May is Children's Mental Health Awareness Month. There was a flurry of activity um, that happened in the month of May. And we really kicked it off with the Mental Health Resource Fair at the State Capitol. Um, that is from nine to two, along with sign waving, our annual sign waving campaign for Children's Mental Health Awareness from 3.30 to 5.30. In addition to that, what was what is really exciting is that uh, our partners went green. So a lot of the evening uh, night lights for some of these buildings around town had um, been changed so that they were green, emulating the spirit of Children's Mental Health Awareness. Uh, so we did have some of the areas were at Venice Health Castle um, over on the Windward side. We had Aloha Tower and Blaisdell Center here in the Honolulu area. Um, even the state capitol and the Board of Water Supply joined in. So all of, all of those uh, buildings were lit green on May 1st. There was also a flurry of activity regarding mental health uh, resource fairs available in the community. So on May 3rd, we had the Windward Community College Mental Health Fair. The day after, Mental Health America um, celebrated their uh, award celebration for um, the Hawaii Awareness event. And then on our neighbor islands, the Lihui Civic Center goes green for the week of May 8th. Sign waving took place on May 11th over in Maui from 8 to 9. And then we really ended up, uh, you know, kind of capturing the entirety of the month for May 20th, which was the really great Malama de Mayan event over on the Big Island at Prince Cujillo Plaza from 10 to 2. Great event, lots of community support, and just really um, a lot of, I, I'd say, camaraderie around the community coming together to celebrate such a you know, a wonderful awareness activity. And this past year, um, that focus shifted. You know, we had we had been talking about mental health awareness for several years now. And um, we follow the National Federation of Families, um, you know, kind of their tagline and what the focus is. And this past year, it really was about accept, advocate, and act. 
Uh, we need to move the momentum. We need to shift the focus because awareness simply isn't enough. We need action behind that statement. So we're going to move to the next slide. Um, so I did want to talk a little bit about family peer support services. Um, that is what we do at Hawaii Families as Allies. And what this entails is for our families to receive support from a peer with lived experience. So this is a peer who is basically the living proof, if you will, of someone that has resilience and has experienced recovery. We know that that is a very wide spectrum, right? When we're talking about recovery, um, there are different points in a journey uh, when you are supporting your child, your youth or your young adult, that uh, recovery looks a little bit different. And that's fine, you know, um, everyone's journey is quite unique and we're, we're basically definitely here to support that. So um, you are supported by peers who recognize the power of connection and healing and shared stories and experiences. What we like to promote is authentic peer support should emulate active acceptance, should be non-judgmental, and really should be respectful of the decisions that are made. Um, we like to say that you're in the driver's seat and we're in the passenger seat and we're heading towards the same destination. So we're figuring and navigating that out together. And really a peer should have some great insights and perspective to help you make the informed decisions that fit the needs of your specific family. So next slide. So some of the benefits that we have for receiving family peer support services, um, there's a lot, but I'm just gonna highlight a few. So an increased sense of collaboration. And what I mean specifically by that is that receiving support and skills training, if you will, it's really to build the skills that our families already have. Um, we help family members to collaborate effectively with other professionals. And this could look like running a mock ISP or IEP meeting together to better help prepare you for the questions that might come up or you know how you would define uh, what types of services that you're looking you know to procure for your child and that sometimes takes practice we have families that can come in and just very well articulate what it is that they need. And then we have um, some of our other families that need some support to get to you know kind of developing what that looks like and what's attainable, right? So that's the collaboration piece. Um, we also, you know, kind of like to focus on the importance of self-care. As caregivers ourselves, um, sometimes we don't really realize when our cup, you know, needs to be filled. And, you know, um, it, sometimes it takes that reflection um, from a peer with lived experience to sort of raise the alarm and, you know, build some community resiliency around some programs or different options that, that we want to make sure that our families are informed of. And then the other piece of this is really um, what we like to call a decrease of family isolation. And so uh, what I mean by that is, you know, in your current circle, you may have family members who do not have a similar experience. And so your outlet, right, for getting uh, help and support looks a little bit different. And that may cause isolation from not really having an outlet to speak with someone specifically about that. And if you, you know, do have um, peer support services from an authentic uh, peer parent support, for an example, those types of conversations can get very deep and they can be, you know, you can have a, a release of that information, but yet have it turn to be a very powerful, you know, moment in the recognition of your journey. So that decreased family isolation um, really is, it's definitely something that we find most often uh, with families because they realize that they're speaking with someone that has been on this journey. And there's that connection that is truly made by sharing. Okay, next slide. Um, so some of the resources that I wanted to recap on as well. Um, so, our, so for Hawaii Families as Allies, we do have our website at hfaa.net. Another really great resource, and I'll make a plug for SPIN right here, is the spinhawaii.org website. Lots of great information, and as well, SPIN puts on this wonderful conference each year to bring lots of great and really useful information to the families within our community. Very, very relevant topics. 
Um, for Hawaii Families as Allies, we are the statewide chapter of the National Federation of Families. And the Federation of Families has been really pioneering, if you will, um, the movement for family support nationally. And so we're connected to many different states. Um, there's a lot of surveys that have been completed that we've had our local families participate in. Uh, one that was pretty compelling was regarding family support during the COVID pandemic. And, you know, what even a, um, what kind of supports and services had, had existed, and also how our families were navigating, you know, a distance learning, as an example. And so I think what was great for us here in Hawaii was to build, you know, our own resiliency in knowing that some of the challenges and the struggles that we were facing was happening all across the country, right? We were not alone in some of those struggles. And um, the DOE really did a great job with um, acclimating, you know, our students and our families um, to make sure that those level of success uh, were, were attainable. So great job there. We also work very closely with the Hawaii Children's Action Network that puts on a lot of um, good resource um, workshops and support groups and parenting information. And then as well, the Mental Health America of Hawaii, um, who is another great resource. They do Wellbeing Wednesdays. And we do um, often send our families there to fill their cup because um, MHA, like I said, they have access to resources that really promote the healing from within. So great resource there. And I think that is the, re the last um, of my slides that I had, but just really wanted to continue to build um, that there are great community partners and resources available for families and really happy to be part of the um, team here because there are additional resources available around trauma um, that really need to be um, widely disseminated for, for more families. Thank you. Thank you, Amanda. Do you have any questions for us or questions that you've gotten from participants of this at the SPIN presentation? No, let me, let me put my video on here so you guys can see me. I'm not a talking head. Hi, everybody. Um, um, I just wanted to follow up maybe on the parents who can take the class with trauma-informed care, the parent, uh, the parent track, needing that login and the contact information. I think that's a great opportunity for families to learn and be learning alongside of the teacher. So how can they get access to that? Yes, absolutely. Um, any parent who's interested um, can just send me an email. Uh, my email address is on that last slide, molly.takagi at k12.hi.us. And I'd be happy to help get them all set up. Uh, and I can share the info sheet as well. Excellent. All right. Well, thank you so much, ladies, for your time today. Really important topic. And we're so glad we got to learn a little bit more about each of you. Thank you and have a great day. Thank Mahalo. you. Thank you.